Ah, now it's on. Very good. Thanks. Uh, and I have to start, uh, well, first of all, uh, with uh, a thank you for uh, having me and inviting me. Um, but then I also have to confess that I didn't quite stick to my assignment. And I will be talking, as you can see from my long title, uh, not only about, about computing, but also about uh, sort of quantum cryptography, communication, and um, even some uh, holography, some string theory. Uh, and the reason is that I'm really excited about this, and I wanted to share that. I thought it would be more fun to have that than uh, another talk, which is sort of more suited for computing. Um, but before that, I want to say a little bit about uh, the institute that I founded um, together with some other people in Amsterdam called QSoft. Um, and the reason I did that, and let's see if I can get my uh, pointer there. Yes, the reason that I did that is because I think it's very important to not only build a quantum computer, but you also have to think about what are you going to do with this machine once it's there, and small ones are already there, as we, as we all know. Um, and so I, de I dedicated the, the, the center to focusing on algorithms and applications and, 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 and all, all other things that you can do with a quantum computer. Um, it started in 2015. It's a joint institute uh, of the University of Amsterdam and the CWI. Um, and it started, sort of, it came out of the quantum co computing group that, uh, that was built from the mid-90s onwards. And currently we have grown to about 80 people, which is not at all as big as what you have here, but still it's a sizable uh, group of people. And we sort of do primarily these four things. We, we think about applications on small devices, like these noisy few qubit applications, and we also think about a little bit about in, into the future. What can you do with uh, computers that have more stable uh, logical qubits? And then we think about uh, qu cryptography, quantum cryptography, uh, and also about information science. And um, we actually also have a few very good people working here. You see Florian Schreck and his labs. They're also connected to, to our institute. And to my surprise, Shortly after uh, founding it, uh, big companies like you see, for example, Bosch, which is a German company, and a bank, and Toyota, and many others now have somehow knocked on our doors, and they want to know what is this computer good for, and if it is any, uh, uh, good for anything, can you help us somehow figure out in our company how that works? Um, and uh, because of that, we also now have a fifth research line, which we call Quantum for Society, and business. Um, well, the currently hosts 80 people, uh, about 30 permanent faculty, postdocs, and PhD students, uh, quite a support staff by now. And also, the institutes at the university are connecting up, like computer science, physics, math, and very recently also chemistry. And we also have connections even with the Department of Law to study the social aspects of, um, of quantum computing. And uh, very importantly, we are part of the Quantum Delta, which is the national program in the Netherlands, which also um, hosts uh, Delft, uh, Eindhoven, and Leiden. So sort of we're part of a bigger, a bigger scheme uh, that runs in the Netherlands. OK, so that about uh, where I come from. Now back to my uh, talk. Um, and um, it's, sort of, it's sort of together with all these people that you see here. Uh, who are either students or, um, uh, like Alex, is, is now um, a tenure track or a, a permanent person in, in Waterloo. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of excited because it's, this topic connects up a bunch of, of areas that somehow seemingly are not at all connected, and I, I wanted to, to share that with you. Um, but it starts out with this question, uh, what is qu uh, position uh, cryptography and position verification. And basically, I, I always like to start with this nice story that in 69, uh, we had our moon project and we put a man on the moon, as you can clearly see here. But there still is a, a staggering, I, I think, a 25 or even higher percentage of the population uh, in, in the US that thinks that actually this never happened and it was staged somewhere um, I think in Texas, or I was told. 
And so this whole thing never happens. So wouldn't it be good if you could prove somehow that you have been at a certain location? Right? And that's sort of the theme of position verification and position cryptography. Um, so you want to prove that you are at a certain position. For example, that the launching missile command really comes from within the Pentagon. So you could still fake it, but you have to be in the Pentagon to actually fake it. So on top of all the security measures that are there, you also have to break in there and, and, and physically be there. Or that you're talking to South Korea instead of North Korea. Or another thing is like the pizza delivery problem where um, you play a prank on your neighbor and you order, I don't know, 50 pizzas for your neighbor. Um, and then you sort of uh, make, a, make a little movie about how all these pizzas are delivered. And of course, that could not happen if you had to prove that you were actually in the location where the pizzas have to be delivered. And so having this position verification in place, it actually figures as a building block for larger things. For example, you can use it for authentication. And for example, you can have um, primitives where you can only decipher a certain message if you are at a particular location. So it comes on top of the, the, the security and cryptographic protocols that we have and it, it uses the geographic location of the person as a key. Okay, so let's look into how this looks. And I'm going to the one-dimensional case. In the three-dimensional case, all the things that I say sort of carry over. So, but it's much easier to think about the one-dimensional case than the three-dimensional case. So let's do that. So what is position verification? So we have these two verifiers here, verifier zero and verifier one. They're trusted. And there is a prover who claims that he's somewhere in between these two verifiers on the line. I drew it in the middle, but that's not really necessary. It could be anywhere. And the prover wants to convince these two verifiers that he's actually at this location. And so we have a couple of assumptions that we have to um, sort of um, take for the moment, but we, we can uh, loosen them in, 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 in due course. Uh, first of all, we assume that communication is occurring at the speed of light. And that's not always the case, but for now, let's assume it is happening at the speed of light. Moreover, we have instantaneous computation, so we can infinitely fast do computation. And moreover, we assume that these two verifiers have coordinated. And we want to have a protocol that is secure in the following sense, that no coalition of fake provers, so there they are, Alice and Bob now figure as fake provers, can somehow sit not at the place uh, where the prover is supposed to be, but intercept all the messages and send all the messages back. So that from the proof, from the verifier's point of view, there actually is someone at the blue spot, but in reality there are, is nobody and there's actually people on the side, right? So this would be bad because this wouldn't prove anymore that the prover is at the blue spot. Okay, so here's a, an idea that somehow doesn't work, but nevertheless, uh, it's, it, it's, it's a good idea. Um, so time flows uh, down, and it's called distance bounding, and here's the idea. Suppose that verifier zero sends a message at the speed of light towards the prover and asks the prover to, upon receiving it, immediately return it. And then if you the verifier times how long this took before the message returned, then this gives you an upper bound on how far the prover is, right? The pr if the prover was here, he couldn't return these messages in this amount of time. And uh, likewise, you do from the other side, and somehow these two cones, these two light cones, where the prover could possibly be, they intersect at precisely one point, and that's the place where the prover is. So this is sort of a nice idea. However, let's study how Alice and Bob can attack this, what Alice can do is she can intercept X, sort of store it for a little while, and then send it back in due course. So as it, it appears now from the verifier's point of view that the message went all the way to the middle point and, and back, but it didn't. And Bob does the same. And now from the verifier's point of view, actually the whole protocol is secure, or is correct, but of course it's, it's now been spoofed. It's, it's not working correctly. So making this slightly more complicated, um, because nothing happened in the middle, let's do a computation in the middle. So uh, the prover now, upon receiving x and y, has to compute some function that produces an a and a b, and then he has to return these a and b's in due course 
to the, to the verifier zero and verifier one. Um, now, unfortunately, this looks better, but it can also be attacked because what Alice can do is she can, upon receiving X, make a copy of it, send X on to Bob and keep the copy locally. And Bob does the same thing upon receiving Y. He makes a copy, keeps the copy locally and sends, uh, sends Y on. And now at this point in time, you see that both Alice and Bob have all the information they need to compute A and B, and then they can compute it and send A and B on in time, right? And this sort of is an attack that always works. And basically it's a proof that classically such schemes can always be spoofed. So there is no secure protocol possible classically. Okay, so here's a nice thing to get sort of in, uh, in uh, under the skin or in the skin or in the position of the attackers. And I want to define a game, which I call the attacking game, where Alice and Bob receive an input X and Y. And so there's no, no timings anymore. They send a message to each other, MX and MY. And then upon uh, receiving that message, they have to produce A and B. Right? That's, this was exactly what the attack was in the previous um, slide. And so without loss of generality, you may assume that in this case, they sent X and Y onwards because that carries all the information that is needed. And so um, this, this copying of information that happens here, that's something that's not possible quantumly. So there is hope here that this game can be played classically, but not quantumly when the inputs are quantum. Um, and I call this inversion one. Somehow I was inspired a little bit by the music of Bach. And this is sort of a change of mindset, right? Instead of thinking about a secure protocol, we now think about a game that attacks that protocol. So we have really changed our mindset from, this, from, a, from a security protocol to an attack to a protocol. And somehow we're going to think now in terms of attacks or this particular game. So here comes a quantum protocol that might work. So imagine now that the verifier sends a quantum bit and also here a classical bit from the other side is sent. And upon receiving that, if the bit is one, the, 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 the prover has to route, route on the qubit to verifier one. And if it's zero, he has to return it back to verifier zero. That's sort of an, an interesting protocol. And it seems that somehow the previous attacks don't work anymore because you cannot make a copy of this thing and store it for later if you have to send it on. So let's study the attacking game for Alice and Bob. So um, Alice and Bob get a, an input. Uh, Alice gets a um, qubit psi and Bob gets a bit zero or one. And he sends a classical, uh, he sends a quantum message now to Alice, and Alice is allowed to send a quantum message to Bob. Um, without loss of generality, you may assume that Bob is just sending the bit B to Alice because there's nothing more that he can send. I mean, that's basically the only thing. And uh, now upon receiving this, if the bit is one, this qubit that was in Alice's possession has to end up on Bob's side. And if the bit is zero, it has to end up on Alice's side. And when you stare at this a little bit, you see that actually some cloning has occurred here because imagine Alice has to send this message to Bob before she receives B. And now imagine that this B was a one, then this message M A has to carry the information of the qubit psi, right? Because it's already sent. And if the bit was one, then actually Bob needs to have it. And since you cannot copy, it has to be sent here. But on the other hand, if the bit was zero, then the, the qubit has to end up on this side. And basically, if you put these together, you see that you made a co cloning machine here. Um, and actually, this was an argument in this paper that said this game is impossible, and hence we have a secure position verification uh, protocol. But there's one thing they forgot, and that is that Alice and Bob can actually share some entanglement, of course. And maybe a nice exercise is that if they share entanglement, you can quite easily see how to actually accomplish this task. So that will be a nice, uh, a nice um, uh, thing to try out if you're into this. Um, and then somehow the hunt was on for more complicated schemes. 
And a bunch of different schemes were proposed by actually quite uh, famous people. For example, here you see uh, Lau and Lo, who actually broke the key quantum key distribution, uh, sorry, who broke the uh, bit commitment, quantum bit commitment scheme. They came up with uh, protocols. And then um, we showed in 2010 uh, with a bunch of people that actually it isn't secure in general. You can always break a, a position verification scheme. And then our scheme was later, our attack was later improved by Peggy and Koenig. Um, and so the most general scheme is the following. Um, the verifier zero sends a density matrix to the prover and verifier one sends a density matrix to the prover. These two may actually be entangled, so it's like part of a larger system. And the prover applies some unitary to this system and then sends back res res uh, a corresponding tau A and tau B to the verifier. This is sort of the most general scheme you can have. And actually, um, uh, attacking this uh, is what we call a non-local computation. So now, actually, we're back to non-local computation. And the attacking game would be something like this. We have Alice and Bob. They each get some quantum system as input, and they have to implement this unitary on both their systems, but they can only send one message independent of each other to each other. And then they have to be able to produce these tau A and tau B. And we showed that this is possible if you use a whole lot of entanglement. We need a double exponential in the number of uh, qubits uh, of, the s of the systems, and then it was um, improved to just a single exponential. But still, a lot of entanglement is needed for this attack. Okay, so uh, there's this no-go theorem that says you cannot do it in general, and that somehow begs two questions. The first is, is this exponential amount of entanglement really necessary, or can you have a better scheme? Can you have a better attack? Or, if that's not the case, does there exist a protocol for which the attack requires many qubits, like exponential, but the honest prover is efficient. If you have that situation, you actually have something that you could run in practice, right? Because exponential entanglement doesn't exist. Right? That's sort of, uh, so it would be an, a, a secure protocol. And question two, which I won't focus on today, is can you realize such protocols experimentally and then deal with imperfections and photon loss, etc.? But I want to focus on question one, for the rest of the talk. And here's a protocol that was put forward by Kent, Munro, and Spiller. So there is, again, sort of combines all the ingredients you've seen so far. There is a Boolean function that depends on x and y and outputs a 0 or 1. The verifier sends x and this qubit, a non qubit, and the verifier 1 sends the, uh, another n bits, classical, and then the prover, upon receiving all these items, computes f of x, y, which is either 0 or 1. And then if it's 1, it sends the qubit on to verifier 1. And if it's 0, it routes it back. So this is a protocol that's quite interesting. And let's study the attacking game for Alice and Bob. So Alice and Bob getting x and psi and y. They send the message to each other. And then if the function is 1, Bob has to have the message. And if the function is 0, Alice has to have the message. And we study the minimum amount of entanglement needed to break this game, to, to play this game uh, well. And the hope is that for sort of nice Fs, for easy Fs, this measure E of F is high, right? Because that would give us a, a secure protocol. Uh, and the intuition that this has to be the case is the following, it's sort of my intuition, which breaks down a little bit. But anyhow, the intuition is that before f of x, y is known, the qubit has to already go to the right side. And so this computation of f of x, x, y somehow has to figure in to the complexity of the entanglement. And somehow my computer science gut feeling says that it has to do with the amount of space that is needed for this computation, and that the entanglement is at least exponential in the amount of space needed to, to do the classical computation. Um, and we were all able to show that, indeed, if there isn't a lot of space needed to compute f, then this intuition is correct. So then we can, indeed, solve this task with that amount of um, <coughs> entanglement. 
And so the big question that we set out is, is there a function f that is easily computable, so it's in p, but it's not in logarithmic space, so, so that the entanglement that is needed is much more than polynomial. And this would really give you a protocol that you could implement in reality that would be secure. And by the way, we weren't able to prove this, but this log space barrier that we're sort of hitting here, that is actually manifest in a lot of other computer science problems. Uh, here is a couple of cryptographic ones that I will briefly talk about, and also this is uh, another one that we have looked at. And then I talked to Alex May, who is in the Stanford group and who is doing this uh, holography, and somehow a very intriguing connection came up, um, because maybe you're familiar with this ADS-CFT correspondence, which says that somehow the, the, the theory in, in, the, in, uh, in this three-dimensional uh, bulk somehow corresponds to a, a computation on the boundary where you're sending stuff to the middle and some computation is done here and then it's sent, stuff is sent out to the, to the boundary again. And this is, there's sort of a correspondence between what happens here. And if you stare at this, you can see that an honest protocol is something that happens here in the bulk where we have the verifiers on the, on the outside and the prover in the middle. And this is somehow, if you look at what the correspondence says on the boundary, it's actually an attack on this protocol. It somehow is, is really an attack. And so this correspondence, if true, suggests that there is a linear upper bound on entanglement and all our theorems kind of don't work. Um, but then we got somehow trick, intrigued by what does this say about all the other um, 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 problems in computer science where we find this, um, where we find this, this barrier as well. Okay, so a little bit about this. I have four more minutes or three more minutes. So here is a, a problem in computer science that pops up. It's called conditional disclosure of secrets. It's the following thing. I have Alice who gets an input X and a secret bit S. Bob gets a string Y of N bits. And there is a referee. And they also share some random bits. And there's a Boolean function involved. And they both send a message MX and MY to the referee. And then the referee learns uh, the, f the function s, learns the, the bit s only if the Boolean function is one. Otherwise, he doesn't learn it. And this is sort of a cryptographic primitive that's sort of useful. Um, and of course, they want to minimize the messages between uh, Alice and Bob. And um, sort of what is known that any function requires, uh, can be done in exponential amount, although not two to the n, but two to the square root of n. And um, sort of the, the log space functions uh, have poly size such schemes. So we looked into the quantum version of this, of this CDS, conditional disclosure of secrets. Um, and we showed, and maybe I won't have time to actually show the proof, unfortunately, but the CDS implies a quantum version of the CDS. And this is equivalent to this attacking game for this, for this position verification scheme that we saw. So funnily enough, a, 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 a protocol that is secure classically implies an attack on this quantum protocol. And somehow this is a, a, a really weird connection. Let me very quickly go over this. So here we have a quantum version of a conditional disclosure of secrets. The inputs are still classical, but the secret now is quantum and we want to minimize the quantum messages sent to the prover. And uh, so the proof that this quantum CDS implies this F routing is the following, and I'll just do it by pictures. Um, so first we purify the protocol. So it, it looks um, something like this. It's a pure state now. Then we somehow replace the prover or the referee by Bob himself. So he's not sending stuff to the referee, but he's sending it to himself, and so is Alice. So the messages that were sent in the in this Q, uh, CDQS are now sent to Bob, and the purification basically is sent to Alice. So Alice holds the purification of the system, and the two messages are sent to Bob. And you see already this is now an, an attacking game, right? Because Bob sends a message to Alice, and Alice sends a message to Bob, and then they end up with this, this system. And now note the following, if the function is one, then Bob is able to learn 
from these MX and MY what that S is. That's just by the security, uh, by the correctness of the protocol. On the other hand, if the function is zero, then Bob is not allowed to learn anything. And that actually means that Alice can recover the, the qubit from the purification. And this is a theorem that is well known that says that um, if you have a pure state and a qubit is somehow <coughs> encoded in there and it's not on one side, then you can always recover it on the other side. So we have sort of a bigger scheme, I'm almost done, a bigger scheme of things. And I want to show that we saw in version one, uh, Alabach, where we went from a text to a communication game. And now we saw in version two, which says that secure cryptographic protocols need quantum attacks. And somehow this weird thing has happened now if you chain them together that a secure classical protocol for one task implies an insecure quantum uh, protocol on the other side. Okay, so consequences I go quickly over. I'm moving to my conclusions. So we've seen that position verification is kind of classically not possible. Quantumly, it may be possible, um, but it somehow ties in with this ADS-CFT connection, and also it ties in with classical protocols. And the funny thing that classical security implies quantum insecurity, uh, has happened here. And um, simple schemes that I haven't talked about, but they exist, somehow are implementable on near term or already current uh, technology. Um, and further work, work really for me is to resolve this tension with ADS CFT. And I think they're wrong. So I think that they actually there are functions that require a lot of entanglement and are easy to compute. They think I'm wrong, so this is this tension. Um, and also, I want to implement these things on quantum networks. Thank you. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation addressing an important issue in our modern society, security. Um, are there questions? Hi, um, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have some basic question. I didn't understand a bit of the more detailed um, uh, protocols, but this uh, elementary protocol you had, uh, the single qubit uh, yes. F routing. Uh, my question is, how, how is sending a qubit based on some classical computation in two different directions a form of verification? Because uh, verifiers are gonna receive the qubit, and what do they do with it? Like if they take a measurement, uh, they're gonna just have a random outcome. So why can't the uh, like attacker just send a completely mixed state and uh, hope that the verifiers get some random stuff? Okay, so yeah, your question is why if you, can you not just send a completely mixed state? Yeah. Um, okay, I didn't really talk about it, but after sort of a round of this has occurred, the verifiers uh, somehow co come together again and they check that the qubit that they sent actually is the qubit uh, that, that they received by doing a measurement, so they know, they prepare the qubit, they know what it, what it was, and then, they, and then they measure in that basis. And, and so if you send a completely mixed state, then with probability half, you will not be giving the right answer there. But they have to do a second state, right? And so that they can do again. Yeah, so, so they, can, they can do this measurement once, and now you have to imagine, I didn't really t t talk about it, uh, excellent question but you have to think about that they repeat this protocol many times and then they do this measurement again and again and now if you would send a completely mixed state each round you'll be sort of wrong with probability half so with extremely high probability you'll be uh, found uh, not at the position where you claim to be yeah first questions very briefly what would be the most critical experimental part for realizing something like that? And what would we ex as experimentalists would have to work on? Oh, um, actually, <laughs> the, 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 the thing, oh, well, let me go over that. For example, are there timing issues uh, yes. that are very critical? <laughs> oh, so here, for example, timing issue is one. Mm -hmm. So uh, for example, I found out, I didn't know, but I know now, that speed <laughs> through fiber is not the speed of light, but it's exactly. the third speed okay. of light. <laughs> and so this actually <laughs> screws up this protocol completely. Okay. 
Okay. Um, so, we, so we have a fix to that. And then another problem is that there's photon loss. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of actually also a lot of photons don't, don't go through. I guess all, you know, you, all your experimentalists know this. Um, but if you take that into account, also the protocols are not secure and you have to come up with ways to fix that, which we have. I mean, I'm not talking about that here now, but we have ways of, of, of fixing, of dealing with photon loss and dealing with the speed of light uh, issue. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, it would be nice if you have better fiber that doesn't have photon loss <laughs> and actually also achieves the speed of light. But anyhow, because in our, in our attack, we assume that the attackers have that. We assume that they have perfect fiber and also that it runs at the speed of light. But um, these were two, are two uh, obstacles that, that we have overcome. Okay, thanks a lot. Ah, there's a a big applause to our first speaker. I, I um, think there's a question still out there. <laughs> yeah. And. Um,